Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Alexis, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, as a docent, I worked with Mr. Hugh Wade um, as just like a fellow docent, um, and it took me a while to realize that the Hugh Wade Feed Store was actually named after Mr. Hugh Wade. Um, and I also learned recently that a lot of the larger or um, more unusual exhibits that we have, he really had a hand in getting those to Discovery Park. Thank you very much, Alexis. Today's guest is Al Claiborne, author of A Time Past or What Might Have Been, The Odyssey of Norman Lane. Welcome, Al. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's always good to be, uh, so to speak, back in West Tennessee again. Absolutely. And we have we have so much to talk about. Um, first of all, I'm curious for anybody who doesn't know, my people come from Haywood County and Al grew up in Haywood County. So tell us a little bit about your past and, and where you grew up and, and how and all that. Sure. Yeah. So I was uh, actually born in Memphis, but my parents were living in Brownsville already. So uh, I grew up in Brownsville on uh, West College Street, just at the bottom of College Hill. Walked right up the hill to Haywood High School. Um, graduated from there in 1970, which was actually historical in the sense that that was the last class to graduate from the original College Hill campus of Haywood High School. I guess the other notable thing about uh, my last three years at Haywood High School, as well as several other of my uh, friends and classmates, were I was a member of John Hooper's uh, Haywood High Tomcats over those three years. We lost one game to Dyersburg in the fall of 1967, and that was the only game that the team lost the entire three years that I was there. So I kind of phrased my role on the team as having been a member. I kind of warmed the bench for Robert Rooks and a lot of the other more notable uh, players on the team. So I graduated from there in 1970, went to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, graduated there in 1974 with a degree in chemistry, and went to graduate school at Duke, where I got my PhD in biochemistry in 1979. Uh, my wife, Terry, and I married while I was at Duke. We moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I was a postdoctoral fellow researcher at the University of Michigan from 79 to 83. We enjoyed our time up there very much. And then we moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina in uh, August of 83, so almost 40 years ago. I joined the faculty of the Wake Forest Medical School of Medicine here and uh, was on the faculty, uh, rose through the ranks as tenured professor and then retired in 2017. So I'm technically an emeritus professor, but I don't have any role at the medical school. And um, I had this project had always been on the. So that's kind of like my brief bio sketch, I guess you might say. And, I'll and, stop and then there. also, you you traveled a lot around. Oh Europe. yeah, yeah. So that was one good thing. So first time I ever went overseas was in uh, 1984. There was a the person that I was working with, my postdoctoral professor at Michigan, uh, had had almost started a field of biochemical research, and in doing so, back in the 1950s and earlier 1960s, he had developed this international group of researchers who sometimes collaborated, but always were working on topics of the same general theme. So from that, there emerged these uh, conferences that would be international symposia on this particular biochemical topic every three years. And so the first time I ever went overseas was in 1984, that conference was at the University of Sussex in England. So my wife, Terry, and I went to that. And so uh, a lot of the travel and a lot of the collaborations that led to other travel, like I wound up going to Japan seven times, uh, 
the original visit to Japan in 1993 was another one of these conferences uh, in, in the field. So that was in 1993, and I met some people in Japan that were in the same area. I got invited back there in 1997 uh, under the offices of some people at a university in Sendai up in the north of Japan. And they encouraged me under the offices of that first visit to travel around to other parts of the country where I, I knew people uh, from the field of research that I was in. And uh, that led to other interactions and uh, more visits to Japan. So as I said, we wound up going over there uh, something like seven times. The last time was in 05. Went to uh, Germany a few months after the Berlin Wall was actually taken down, which was a very interesting. Uh, my wife and I actually stayed in what was East Berlin at the time. You didn't need a visa to cross back and forth between West and East, but it was a very interesting time. Uh, coming from America and being in East Berlin, uh, you weren't exactly treated uh, with the most uh, friendly hospitality uh, uh, aspect. So okay. that was an interesting experience as well. So, yeah, we, we did a good bit of traveling in that sense. And when you talk about research, it, it was a different kind of research you were doing back then than what you ended up doing on this book, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But uh, so so I don't want to go too much in depth about the development of the book project. So stop me if I go too far in that direction. Oh, that's impossible. You, the, you, we, uh, OK, we, all right, we well, can talk forever. OK, well, the concept or the the initial seed of this project actually happened in Brownsville when I was 16 years old. And that was the day that the news came to Brownsville and Haywood County that Norman Lane had been killed in Vietnam. I had one inkling. I was only, I, was, I had been six, uh, my 16th birthday was like five days before. So you can only imagine how sheltered our lives were there and how uh, naive about the world, how naive about Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera, were. So I had one inkling prior to that, that he was even in the Marine Corps or even in Vietnam. But my mother in particular had a very strong family connection to his grandparents who lived in Brownsville. And that was Marion and Elizabeth Thornton, who at the time lived on North Washington, just a few, few uh, addresses down from the Episcopal Church. And so what I remember from that day was I had been with another friend. We were sophomores in high school. We were at another friend's house doing sophomore high school stuff. It was a Saturday afternoon. I drove my friend back to my house because I was thinking I was going to be able to drive him uh, to his home. I had, you know, I just got my driver's license five days before as well. And the thing I remember was as we got out of the car, my mother and father were both coming out of the house and you could sense that there was some anxiety or some angst, something was happening. There was a commotion. And I'm, I must have spoken to my mother, but before I could even complete the sentence, she said, we have to go see Aunt Lib. That was Elizabeth Thorne who lived on North Washington. Norman Jr. has been killed. Mm. And uh, even though I didn't know Norman Lane well, he was 11 years older than I was. I mean, we had met a few times. We were both in the same family, that being the Taylors of Tabernacle extended family. But I didn't really know him well. But I think it was the the fact of the way that it shook up my extended family, my mother, her favorite aunt and uncle, Marion and Elizabeth Thornton, who had lost their only son in World War II. Hmm. So it kind of reverberated much more heavily than if it had been a friend of mine, probably. And uh, so it was always in the back of my mind, but it was only in 2014, uh, just a random Internet search. I made contact with uh, a person from Brownsville who had not only been a friend of Norman Lane's there in town growing up, but had also wound up serving in Vietnam with the Marine Corps with the same battalion that Norman Lane was assigned to in the same time frame. And uh, that led to my being able to contact him. His name was Alan Willard, uh, graduated from Haywood High School in 1964. And once we made that connection, uh, that really got the ball rolling in terms of my being able to explore who Norman Lane was and uh, sort of the beginning and the continuation of the odyssey of Norman Lane, I guess you might say. 
Now, when you first got started, did you ever have any idea just how deep you would go into? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, you know, I had read some books about Vietnam back in the late 80s. I'd seen movies that had started coming out even in the late 70s. But I didn't have any resources or any connection with Norman Lane in the Marine Corps in particular, or Vietnam for that matter. And Alan Weird, the clue to Alan Weird was in the fact that the virtual wall, which maybe not everybody's familiar with, but it's sort of a digital representation of the names that are on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C., but it also has background information about each individual that you can access on your computer. And so I think it actually got started back around 2005, but I didn't discover it until 2012 at the earliest. And there was a page there for Norman Lane, and Alan Weird had submitted a post there that identified himself as having been a friend of Norman's growing up in Brownsville. So Alan Weird was from Brownsville. He had graduated from Haywood High School. I never knew him or knew of him. And so we had a bit of a search there early in 2014. And once we found Alan uh, and a few other of the people that Norman had known either through the Tabernacle Campground, through the annual camp meeting, that family, the high school students. He had taught for a year at Haywood High School from 1965 to 66, students that had been in his classes there. We decided to hold or to try to hold a memorial tribute at the Tabernacle Campground during the camp meeting that summer of 2014. And that brought together all of these people from all of these totally different walks of life, so to speak, who had known Norman Lane from totally different perspectives. Fellow Marines from Vietnam, students from high school, relatives who had known him growing up, other people from Brownsville, and even one person from West Vancouver, British Columbia, where Norman lived growing up from the age of 10 until he went to college. And so that was in 2014 still. So that's almost nine years ago. And every one of those seeds, if you will, or every one of those perspectives turned out to be sort of a seed that then sprung and developed its own roots and its own trees and its own branches and and led to, to further, uh, you know, individuals in the Marine Corps from Vietnam, from Norman Lane's OCS class at Quantico, et cetera, et cetera. Students at Vanderbilt that had been close friends and still uh, contributed heavily to this book project. Uh, one person in particular who I only made contact with about six years ago. She had been a student, an undergraduate at Vanderbilt. She graduated in 66. Norman had graduated from Vanderbilt in 62, but then he went to law school there through the summer of 65. He didn't uh, graduate, I'll put it mildly, okay? But he stayed in the school, in the law school through the summer of 65. I made in contact with her about six years ago. She had kept, over all of these years, every letter and every postcard that Norman Lane had ever sent to her, whether he was teaching high school in Brownsville, whether he was in Quantico in OCS with the Marine Corps, whether he was serving at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where he was posted in the summer of 1967, and then ultimately when he was in Vietnam. And so that was just a major, major resource, as it turned out. There were other people like that, although they didn't have quite the complete collection of letters, but a number of people, fellow students at Vanderbilt that were close to him, had very clear recollections of Norman. And it was surprising to me, just because I didn't really know the fellow that well, how many people from how many different perspectives came back and said, what an extraordinary person he was. Not extraordinary in the sense of good necessarily, but extraordinary in terms of his talents, his skills, what he what might have been, so to speak. Uh, and, and that really uh, led to the culmination of the project and the, the beginning of the book project. So at what point along the way, probably not right when you started out, but at some point along the way, you decided this should be a book. I would say uh, I was doing, I have a WordPress site that I'd actually started way back in 2015. And a lot of those were stories, individual stories 
uh, about Norman Lane, whether in the Marine Corps in Vietnam, before he went to the Marine Corps, et cetera. And so I had this collection of work. And then I think early in 2019, I, I thought I had, so he was killed in action the end of March of 1968. I carried the story through the end of 1968. And I said, you know, there's, I, I can't legitimately continue this on and on and on uh, because he's not with us anymore. And so probably about that time, 2019 or so, I decided to sit down and start collecting all of these individual stories. And then I added other things that I had never published on my WordPress site and sort of tried to glue things together and eliminate duplications from the individual stories and that sort of thing. And then I think it, that went on. I think in 2019, I actually submitted a version of the book manuscript to a publisher. And you can only imagine how naive I was in terms of the length of the manuscript, uh, et cetera, et cetera, lack of a bibliography and so on and so forth. And finally, it was about early 2021, uh, a friend of mine on the medical school faculty had published a book about his father who had been in the Navy in World War II. And he recommended a professional manuscript reader, I would say, not a reviewer necessarily, but somebody who would look at this and say, OK, here's where this needs to go. or Here's what you need to do. And that was actually about two years ago. And he came back and said, no publisher is going to pick this up because if it's modern biography, what you have done is you have outlined the facts of occurrences and so on and so forth in a very, I would consider, a very historical way. What we want to see in modern biography is we want to see dialogue and be creative and, you know, sort of make things up a little bit. And I said, I can't do that. I want to stick to the story and the facts of the story because I wasn't around for 90 percent of what happens in the book or is described in the book. And so I decided and he mentioned at that time self-publishing with Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. And then later in 2019, I guess it was or 2021, it was uh, I made contact with an author in Britain. He's an expatriate. He, he's an American citizen. Uh, who had self-published with Amazon KDP. And he said, oh, yeah, this works really well, but then you have to get a proofreader, and then you have to get a book formatter, and then you have to get somebody to do the maps and the photos and everything. Else. So probably two years ago, I decided I was going to do Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. So that then led to a professional proofreader. I also worked a lot on the manuscript after I got it back from this liter literature guy. Submitted it to a professional proofreader in the fall of 2021. Started the process of book formatting. You know, we'd gotten the photos and the maps. And those things came together on the side. Started the book formatting process a little over a year ago. And the book formatter is very good. But, you know, there, the author, I'm the editor. I mean, you know, there is no other person that's going to go through this and say, well, this block quote needs to be indented X or you need to abbreviate this such and such or whatever. And so we just went through a lot of rounds. I mean, after all, the book is 699 pages, so it's not a not a small piece of work. Yeah, that's and, amazing. Uh, he just stuck with it, and I stuck with it, and we just kept through it. I mean, I think, you, you know, you mentioned about my scientific career in biochemistry and this sort of career, and I would say it, it was interesting in that in biochemistry or the type of research that we did was very analytical, you know, very precise. And the meaning of numbers was really very significant. And I think a lot of that precision and that sort of analytical methodology carried over into this book. And as I said, I think in the foreword, you know, I think the reader once said that this read sort of like an academic essay. Well, I said, well, you know, I was a tenured professor of biochemistry for 24 years. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and so, so uh, you know, so that's the way the book uh, evolved. And so then uh, I got the first proof copy of the paperback in, can you see this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see. Yeah, I'm not looking at it myself, so that's how thick it is. <laughs> yeah, man, it's um, really th it's thicker yeah, than, than yeah. most of the Kindle KDP books. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway, so I got the first. So all of this is being done with a big PDF file, 
you know, just like, almost like a word file. And then finally, right before Christmas, I got the first proof version of the paperback. And I opened the envelope and I saw the same guy that did the formatting, did the cover design. And when I saw this and I saw the quality of the text, which is extremely readable. Yeah. And in particular, I saw the quality of the color and as well as the black and white photos. I said, this is going to knock my socks off. <laughs> and possibly it'll knock some other readers' socks off as well. Well, I mean, you have been you've been basically researching and working on this for how many years? Well, it started nine years ago when we yeah. first had that memorial tribute and I first met some of the people that knew right. Norman. Everybody, everybody in this project knew Norman much better than I did. Yeah. Um, so uh, it started nine years ago. I still had my academic position. So, I mean, I published a scientific paper in 2015. So it wasn't like 100 percent of my effort, but they did allow me to do this work while I was still on the medical. But when you when you write a, a biography like that, you get to know the person you're writing about in a way that they feel like they're you know them better than, you know, some of your your family members. I think I know Norman Lane better than a lot of people who were closer to him also. Yeah. And that's yeah. not meant to be a no, it's just when you, when you, just when you write that much and you analyze that much and you research, um, you really do get to know them in a way that's um, just crazy. It's hard to explain to anybody who hasn't ever written a biography. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about the story was it did dovetail. In fact, the whole first chapter or first part of the book deals with his grandparents, Marion and Elizabeth Thornton, their son, Marion Thornton Jr., who was uh, killed in action during World War II. And I won't go into too much detail because I don't want to give the whole story away. But there's a nice, I think the theme of the first chapter really is a theme that a lot of people could take home when they think about war and loss in war. And it's families, war, and remembrance. And I think that tells Norman's story. If you went from page one to page 699, that would be an overriding theme throughout. Yeah, we've got um I've got a I don't know, distant cousin, maybe three times removed, um, who is buried at Holly Grove uh church cemetery and when i was a little kid my grandmother his name was uh sammy castellaw and when i was a little kid my grandmother took me and just told me a little bit about his story um of course he died during world war ii and you know in recent years i've researched more and found out more about him and mm -hmm. you know it's just weird how that becomes sort of a touchstone oh you yeah know, when, Absolutely. You're, when you're yeah. doing this and and you know my mother had so marion Thorne jr was her closest first cousin on the Thornton family side out of 20. He was like three years older than she was. And I found about seven years ago, while she was still living, I, vi I was visiting her at home and she pulled out this bag from under, plastic bag from under the bed. And she said, you might want to have this. She had kept every letter that Marion Thornton Jr. had written her from the time he entered the service. And so I've got, I had that resource. And then the other thing was one time, uh, after she had moved out to Shirt Creek to the retirement home there, uh, I was just kind of rambling through a desk in what had been her bedroom, and I found this old spiral-bound notebook, and she had just started writing. And it was the story of her childhood friendship with Marion Thornton Jr. and went up through the period uh, that uh, they was in the service. And, they did that. and my father and his brother, Gene Claiborne, there both served in combat in World War II, and they lost their third brother, Robert Claiborne, in combat in Italy. In the so both, both of my parents had suffered a loss, significant loss in World War II, and my father in particular never forgot his brother, Robert. I mean, I had stories from 40 years after the war that he would still break down in private and sob over the loss of his brother. So yeah, those well, kinds of emotions, you just go up around that. Even if you don't discuss it a lot, you know, it's there. And, there's and something, it's something about totally those moments where you discover those photographs or those letters or the connection. It's it sort of fuels the addiction to keep going and keep researching. And, you know, there's nothing quite like it for people who are into it. Um, I'm going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I'm going to find out more about uh, Norman Lane.
The Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge was established about 15 miles southwest of Discovery Park to manage the upper third of Real Foot Lake as a refuge for migratory birds. There, you'll find a wintering ground for waterfowl and bald eagles. They host multiple activities throughout the spring, summer, and fall, including the annual youth fishing rodeo, junior ranger camp, various workshops, archery programs, guided canoe trips, eagle tours, and more. For their complete schedule, Google Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and today's guest is Al Claiborne, author of A Time Past, or What Might Have Been, The Odyssey of Norman Lane. So without giving away too much of the uh, story, tell us a little bit more about exactly who Norman Lane was, what he did, how he died, and what caused uh, – why, why do you think it's important that we look at him and, and, and what his contribution was to, to the war? Well, I think anybody that gave their lives in the service of the country deserves to be remembered. Anybody. And so there certainly is that category that he would fit into. I think he was also a very unusual – person to go into the Marine Corps. Uh, So from his childhood, from when he was 10 years old, his father was a very successful civil engineer, and he and his family moved to West Vancouver, British Columbia, where his father worked in the city of Vancouver as a civil engineer. And so Norman was extremely bright in school. Uh, His sister, younger sister, once was quoted as saying, when she entered school, she didn't want any of the teachers knowing that she was Norman Lane's sister because he he was so bright and so the expectation might be there. But he did finish a year ahead of his uh, peers uh, there in high school in West Vancouver. And he started out at uh, the University of British Columbia, stayed there for a couple of years and then uh, transferred to Vanderbilt in Nashville. Uh, at the time, his Parents were moving from West Vancouver to New York State, outside New York City and uh, Westchester County. And I and of course, his grandparents, his maternal grandparents were living in Brownsville. And I guess that those factors were large in his consideration to transfer to Vanderbilt. So he went there in the fall of 1960. John F. Kennedy had just visited Nashville a few days before. Norman started classes at Vanderbilt just to get as a as a candidate for uh, president. So just to give us some kind of historical context of the time. And uh, in his senior year, he, he did well at Vanderbilt. He was an English major. He was in what was considered the inaugural Vanderbilt in France program in the fall of 1961. The first group of students from Vanderbilt University went to Aix-en-Provence in France in the fall of 1961 to start the program. He made perfect grades in that. And one of his best friends who contributed heavily to the book, to the story, met Norman on the ship going overseas to enter into that program. And he talked uh, fluidly about Norman's, his, his just ability to absorb knowledge about anything. He said they would be riding motor scooters down the road and there would be some unusual plant or vegetation on the side of the road. Norman would stop the motor scooter, go over there and identify the plant by its Latin name. Where did all this knowledge come from? I think people that knew him the best still don't have an answer to that question. He would take um, during the camp meeting events, which were usually in August, uh, He would take groups of, well, children, young people out on the field and look up into the stars and he could identify every constellation and talk about its mythology and its origins and so on. So where did all that information come from? I don't know. So he was a very intelligent fellow. But then when he went to law school at Vanderbilt, I think his best friends say he could have done anything. But he didn't put the effort in. And uh, although he stayed with the program for the full three years and then actually did a summer session after that, he did not graduate. And I think that kind of uh, changed his, maybe his demeanor about his goals for his life, even at that stage. You know, he was only at that time, I think he was only 24 when he finished uh, the Vanderbilt Law School program. 
So it was kind of a happenstance series of events that led him to teaching high school in Brownsville. So he taught English uh, and French there at the old uh, College Hill campus of Haywood High School. Which let me ask you a question real quick. Um, they have a museum in there now, and I've been in that museum many times. It, 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 there's a little bit in there about Norman Lane. Yeah. Lynn Shaw, yeah. who the, I guess started that museum. Yeah. And I, I met also, he was one of Norman Lane's closest friends. They were oh. almost the same age. And this goes back to like when they were in high school age, at least in their teens, because Norman and his mother and sister would come back to Brownsville and spend the summers with his grandparents uh, prior to the camp meeting events in August. So Lynn had gotten to know Norman that way. They were very close friends. Lynn told a story in 2014 about going on this long bicycle ride, just the two of them, which had an interesting ending. But anyway, yeah, so Lynn actually took, because of this friendship, he took uh, the initiative so Norman's uh, one of his summer uniforms is there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then more recently, the museum added uh, when Norman graduated from OCS, he purchased an officer's Marine sword, sort of ceremonial. He had left that to Lynn when he died. And then after Lynn passed away, the museum was able to purchase it from the estate. So that's there. Now, there may be some other things. I haven't been up there in, in a little while. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I, that's the first time I was aware of him. And when you mentioned the high school, I thought it was interesting that a lot of his stuff is back there at the yeah, high school. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so uh, so he, he taught there and students, you know, he was different as a teacher, but they also talked about, I mean, one of them, I won't use any names here, but he would talk about during the middle of a sophomore English class, I mean, this is Haywood High School in 1965. I mean, you know, um, in one case, there was some insect on the window and one of the students in the class squashed the insect. And Norman changed the whole day's lecture to the life of an insect. And they would take walk around the campus and look at all the trees and Norman would identify every tree and, you know, how long was it going to live and et cetera, it's Latin names and all that sort of thing. So it was very unusual. He would take the class out and look at the constellations at night on his grandparents' farm, things like that. But the students all admired him. And, you know, some, I think, may have, have had a different spin on it. The ones I talked to, I guess, are, are the ones that I'm referring to here. And they all thought what a different type of teacher he was and how much he taught them to love to learn, regardless of what the subject of the day was. But his letters during especially the spring of 1966, and again, these letters come from one person that he was writing to, a very close friend. But I have to acknowledge that I didn't have access to letters that he wrote to all these other all of his other friends. So based on that one set of lectures or letters, rather. He started having questions about his life and his future and so on and so forth. And actually, it was in that spring semester. You could also see some dissatisfaction, uh, maybe some more uh, serious uh, affectations. But it was in that uh, early in that uh, spring semester of 1966 that he first entertained the notion of joining the Marine Corps as an officer. And he went back and forth between the Navy OCS and the Marine Corps OCS. Not that these were always on his mind all the time, but when he did think about military career, he thought about Navy OCS and Marine Corps OCS. And actually in the letter that he wrote very shortly before he went to Nashville, April 1 of 1966, and enlisted with the Marine Corps for the purpose of attending OCS. I think a letter that he had written a week or so before that, he had mentioned having an appointment with someone in the Navy OCS recruiting station in Nashville. So exactly what changed his mind at that last moment or et cetera, no one probably will ever know. But uh, it was a very fateful decision because even in 
uh, the spring of 1966, going into Navy OCS and going into Marine Corps OCS, two very different paths in terms of combat and the tribulations of combat and the dangers of combat. And, you know, at that time, the United States was still escalating uh, the war in Vietnam. So uh, by the time Norman got there in November of 1967, uh, because he didn't go, he graduated from OCS in March of 67, went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. From there, went to uh, Guantanamo Bay, came back, had the 30 day leave, and arrived in Vietnam in the middle of November of 67. Two months later, the Tet Offensive began. Uh, so, and everybody knows, well, most people know what a challenging time that was for America. Well, I, I know your book. <laughs> Your book is a, because of all the research you've done, it's also a look at the Vietnam War. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, the, because I was learning things. Because, you know, I was 16, and, you know, even when I went to college, you know. Um, so there were just a lot of occasions where it was interesting to me to see what was going through Norman's mind and his ambitions as far as his life and his milit potential for a military career and what was going on in the country and what uh, journalists and other authors and correspondents at that time were thinking about it and writing about it and so forth. Like Theodore White in particular, I think he, he is the author, the journalist who did the well-known Making of the President series. I think he started in 1960 with the presidential election, 64. So I looked at the 64 version, which was published in 1965, which was really very, very, very early in the major American buildup in Vietnam, and looked at what he wrote then. And then I looked at what he wrote in the making of the president in 1968, which was published in 1969, and his perspectives and talking with Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and so on and so forth. So... Uh, there was quite a lot going on. And in fact, the story of the first Haywood County casualty in Vietnam, which is in the book, um, occurred in November of 1965, Platoon Sergeant William Farrell from Stanton. And he was sent over with the 1st Cavalry Division. President Johnson made a very well-known speech from the East Room on July 28, 1965, which is in some ways the die is cast. We're going to roll the dice thinking that 100,000 more troops in one year and it'll all be over. And that's when he committed the 1st Cavalry Division to Vietnam. And they arrived in uh, mid-September. Soon Sergeant Farrell was killed in action in the Battle of the Audrang Valley, which Hal Moore and Joe Galloway documented so well in the book, We Were Soldiers Once. So that, you know, that that also is going on. So and that's in the time frame that Norman is making his decisions or considering his decisions uh, uh, that ultimately led him into the Marine Corps. So. And how long did he serve before he was killed? In Vietnam? Yeah. He, he had been in Vietnam four and a half months. Mm -hmm. So he arrived there November the 14th and was killed in action on March 29th. And... Uh, is is um is there a historic marker for Norman Lane? I know there's one for Richard Halliburton in Brownsville and some other historic markers. Is there one? What we did when we started this project, and this does get into some of the family uh, story and the family remembrance. When Marion Thornton Jr. was lost in World War II, it was the fall of 1948 before he was brought back for burial at the Tabernacle Cemetery. And the cemetery, you've been there, I guess. So yeah, I actually uh, went to the, uh, see, what was, uh, they had an open house this past year, and my wife and I went, and we, we, we were exploring the cemetery, and I had forgotten that he was buried there, and I came upon his uh, tombstone, and I thought about you and your book immediately. Yeah, yeah, so the cemetery gates at Tabernacle, I mean, there was an early version. I mean, the cemetery's been there about 200 years from the first burial. But the current version of the cemetery gates were built, erected, and dedicated in 1956 in memory of Marion Thornton. Mm. And if you go there, if you went there um, even 10 years ago, 
there were the gates, the gate posts, and there was a plaque, a bronze plaque on one gate post. And it was in memory of Marion Thorne Jr. And that had always been there. It was there when Norman was growing up. And so the first thing we did in 2014 was we arranged for a plaque for Norman Lane that goes on the other gate post. So you've got the uncle and the nephew from the same family tree uh, there. I don't know of anything else beyond that other than his names on the the Haywood County Monument there on the courthouse square. And those are the only things that come to my mind. So kudos, first of all, for all the incredible research. I know I've been following along for years as you've been sending up updates. And uh, I know a lot of people are listening to this are going to be anxious to buy the book. Where do they need to go to get a more information and then B to buy the book? Yeah. So the easiest way to buy the book. So I've put a lot of flyers around on my mailing list and so forth. So there's a QR code on the flyer. So if you have access to the flyer, just scan the flyer. Um, by the way, I should mention Jack Pettigrew agreed to host a display copy of the book at Livingston's. So if you want to look at a copy without necessarily buying it or just see what it's like, you can go there. I think he's also got the flyer on display. So the QR code is the easiest, but if you don't have the flyer, if you go to Amazon.com, and I tested it this out, the best way to get directly to the Amazon book details page for the book is four words, Al Claiborne Norman Lane. And use that search phrase on Amazon.com, and it'll go straight to the book. Other variations go to the book and some other things, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the easiest way. And then we also did, I mean, we've had a website for the nonprofit for several years. We also developed a new website for the book uh, that we just launched uh, a few weeks ago. And the easiest way to go to that is to go in your search, if you use Google or whatever, Google the Odyssey of Norman Lane book site. And that'll take you straight to a website. The title is The Odyssey of Norman Lane, derived from the title. And then I'm also going to throw in, if you go to Norman Lane Jr. Jr. Memorialproject.org or search Norman Lane Memorial Project, there's a lot of photographs. There's a lot of your research. I mean, it's just, it's uh, amazing the amount of research that you've put into this. So, um, and I think you can sign up for your e-newsletter on there as well, can't you? Um, because I know you I get, love getting- What I would encourage anybody who's interested who hadn't been familiar or whatever, or is interested in the book or whatever, just email me or text me directly. And uh, uh, the email address is a little more, but my, uh, you can give them my phone number if you want. I mean, it's okay. Yeah, what, what's your um, your email address? Is it so on? The email address is alc at csb, like Charlie Sarah Bravo, dot WFU, like Wake Forest University, dot edu, like education. Yeah, and, excellent. Uh, if you want my cell number, you can have that too. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's a great way to get the word out about the book and answer questions. And um, I, I cannot thank you enough for, for uh, being here with us today. It's so well, interesting. thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you so much for helping me to get the word out and helping all those that contributed to the book to get the word out as well. And thanks to all you listeners who have joined um, Al Claiborne, Alexis, Luke, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <music>